My wife is 25 years old, and I am 30 years old. We have been together for almost six years total. We have never had children, no real assets, and more debt than money in our bank account. We live in a rental property, and I am the main provider, earning about 5000 a month, while my wife makes about 1500 My work family is quite close-knit. A co-worker of nearly three years persuaded me to join in a recreational soccer league, which I've played in for two years. I bust my ass to provide her the life she's accustomed to, and now confronting the unthinkable. In the back of my mind, I knew that my wife's attendance at every soccer game I played was a sign of support for me, but most nights I had games. I would take it very lightly when it came to alcohol. But she would get pretty wild during the games and ride home with me quite a bit. After the games, some of the guys and girls would get together at different places to hang out into the night. Sometimes we would all return to my place, other times we would go to a bar, pizza place, etc. A few weeks prior, a few of them were scheduled to meet at one of the guy's houses in a different city from mine. I apologized to everyone after the game and said we wouldn't be attending because I had an early shift the next day. She texted one of the guys I thought of as a pal on the way home, asking him to give her a lift, and she asked me if it was good for her to go while I was driving home. I said no since I wanted to spend tonight with you and I have work in the morning. When I got home, I pulled onto the drive and there was a car in front of the house. It was my friend. She had made the executive decision to go to this party, and I was furious. She had given me the angry alcohol excitement treatment. When I got to my friend's car and ordered him to get lost, my wife stepped out of mine and got into his, and they drove off. I was so furious that I took out the defunct iPad I had purchased for her a few years prior and even though it was ancient, I knew it was linked to her social media message accounts. I attempted tracking her location and didn't go to sleep until around 3 in the morning. But she wasn't home. She was in bed when I woke up the next morning. I had no idea when she had returned home. That morning, I got up, got ready for work, and left without saying goodbye to her or giving her a kiss, the first and only time that had ever happened. I wanted her to know how angry I was. I took the iPad and threw it in my briefcase before I left for work that day. When I got there, I noticed that Buddy was typing on the iPad. I opened the messaging app and saw a horrifying exchange of messages that are meant to end on their own. But this version of the app must have been out of date because I was able to watch in real time their conversation, recounting the previous night's events in which Buddy made references to them making love and other guys having a good time. I was so close to losing it, but it got worse. I watch as my wife orders my buddy to email her a video of him masturbating, which he dutifully did and I regrettably observed. I was so shaken by what I had just witnessed that I bolted from my office into the bathroom and puked all over the place. I was even granted permission to leave work for the day. After giving myself a few hours to calm down, I drove home to find her still asleep on the bed set my belongings down, and asked her to come downstairs because I was honestly frightened I was going to hurt her or myself. I asked her, sitting across from her, to tell me everything that had transpired the previous night, including everything she had done except for any sexual encounters. We had just talked, drank, and played pool. I then asked her when she had last spoken to her friend, and she said that she had exchanged some messages with him that morning, but nothing specific. Would your tale change if you knew I watched the whole thing you had with him this morning? That's when I dropped the bomb. Are you leaving me? Was the first thing she spoke after breaking down in tears. She admitted to me that she couldn't really recall it precisely, but she could only recall having sex with her friend and another teammate last night. She couldn't recall having sex with any other guys. I questioned her whether this was the first time, horrified, and to my surprise, she said that there had been other occasions, one even occurring in my home while I was sleeping upstairs. I really hope I don't take the cake for worse D-Day experience, but it's hard to think of anything worse than catching your wife in a gangbang scenario with guys you've welcomed into your lives and to find out that this has been going on for months with at least one of the guys.
Now she wants to blame it all on alcohol and swear she's going to start AA and wants to now go through couples therapy. She wants us to come out of this together. That was it. I helped her pack her bags and she left the house to stay with family. She begged me not to tell anyone. I think it's a little late, but I'm a chump and I feel all the negative emotions associated with PTSD, including guilt. I have an appointment with an attorney tomorrow and I like to think that I'm doing the right thing. Regardless of how broken she is from her past as an alcoholic and how much I want to work things out. I can't even speak to her without picturing her as the lunch meat in a douche sandwich. I can't trust her. I'm disgusted by her repeated actions. I deserve a lot better than that, and I'm not perfect, but why in the world do I feel so guilty? There's no reconciling this, right? I feel like an idiot putting this all out and seeing it so plainly, but it's not simple to just stop caring about the person you were completely and fully surprised by. Please take it easy on me. Any support or words of wisdom are highly welcomed. Update. Hi everyone, once again. It's going to be the second anniversary of my D-Day in 17 days. Looking back at my last post, I can honestly say that I never imagined I would get this far in terms of the amount of time that has passed and the healing of the hurt, sadness, and pain I felt as a result of my ex-wife's horrible actions. Several of you kind people have messaged me asking for an update, and all I can say is, ask with caution. Hopefully, this will be my last update regarding events since the formal divorce. If you were enjoying being shocked, shocked, horrified, or left thinking, unbelievable. Read the postings below before moving on. If you're just now joining the conversation, here's a little light reading to catch you up. Naturally, a lot has happened since my last update, but some significant incidents that really highlight how horrible people can be have occurred. I tried my hardest to stay out of contact after the divorce was finalized in February 2019, but it's harder said than done these days. I didn't talk to her or anything, but every now and then, I would see a post from a distant family member of hers that I hadn't blocked, or a friend would mention something they saw on a much old friend's Snapchat or something similar. While my genuine pals made every effort to keep these kinds of developments to themselves, Sometimes the news was just too significant to withhold. The first big break came in May 2019, when I received a call from one of my closest friends informing me that my ex-wife was remarrying a, a man from Tennessee. Hold on, what? Yes, that was accurate. My friend's husband was able to get pictures of the happenings preceding the major announcement since he had not yet blocked my ex-wife on Facebook. Remember, all of this happened between March and July of 2019. It seems that once the divorce was finalized, Buddy and her didn't last very long. I'm not sure how it ended, and while I kind of wish I had, it's not shocking at all. A series of Facebook status updates, beginning in April, subversively hinted that she was falling in love and implied that everything was occurring for a reason. Poor soul. Then, as if by magic, in July, she went to her wall and saw a simple photo of herself and some random guy that none of them knew or had heard of, holding hands, rings on fingers, pulling up what appeared to be a marriage certificate. The photo was geotagged in California, proudly bearing her new last name, and the caption read something like, excited to start the rest of my life with such an amazing man. I'm really grateful. Watch out, Tennessee, for our arrival. There was a sudden, astonished pause. I am aware that the whole story, going all the way back to my very first post, may appear unbelievable, but there is no other evidence I can provide you with than the fact that I am recording God's unvarnished word. I felt I had to warn you before continuing. I could not bear the tremendous interest of the situation. These following few sentences may lose some of you, but I hope if you've read this far, you have some faith in me. I acquired the rest of the tale from a fairly well-liked cousin-in-law of my ex-wife, who complied when I reached out to him. Her new spouse was someone she had met online and had been communicating with via text, phone calls, 
and other means for a few months. It seems that they both fell in love quickly, and he asked her out over the phone. She accepted and couldn't wait to get married. A week after the proposal, she made a sincere effort to tell her family and extend an invitation for them to attend the wedding, which, for some reason I cannot understand, was held in a completely random town, two hours away from our hometown. After he took a plane to California, they were married on a Saturday, which also happened to be their first face-to-face -face meeting, but they were now husband and wife. The worst part, the cousin claims, is that not a single member of her family was present at the courthouse wedding. I'm sure it bothered her greatly that they were married so hurriedly, whether it was for lack of respect or time to prepare. I've heard enough accounts by now to know that the timeline and story are true, but it was just unbelievable at the time. That poor, poor man, if only he knew. That Sunday was spent packing a moving truck with all of her belongings, and they set east for Tennessee on Monday. Hopefully, he was just ignorant rather than that stupid. For the time being, I tried my best to push the thought of the two of them out of my head. But I did take comfort in the fact that they were moving far, far away, where I know I wouldn't have any chance of randomly running into her ever again. If he had known, I'm sure he would have had the presence of mind to not get married in California, a no-fault state where he could fall into the same situation I was facing with her. 2019 summer was finished, but in the midst of September, there was yet another bombshell. As I was scrolling through Instagram, a video showing my ex-wife holding a dish in front of her father appeared, with him shielding his eyes with his hands. My ex-wife's voice came through, counting down three, two, one. It's a boy, as her father opened his eyes, and before I knew what I was looking at, I noticed that there was just one cookie on the plate, covered in blue frosting. Her mother had just made an Instagram account, fully public, and shared this video of her husband's excitement, a gender reveal. Why was I seeing this? That was a really horrible few days and sleepless nights. Apparently, Instagram's algorithm believed I'd like to see this video from someone I may know. I lost it entirely. The other emotion I experienced was a mixture of disgust, pain, frustration, and even a hint of jealousy. Being a father was one of my greatest life goals, and if everything had not transpired in our past timeline, this very well might have been the moment when we became parents to each other's child. It might have even been my child, and I might have been the father. I could have been the one becoming a father. I'm 32 years old now. I thought I'd be one by now, much less not even on a path towards having a relationship, let alone a child. I'm a mature man, and I realize I do have some time ahead of me to achieve that dream with someone I love and am happy with. But I can't stop myself from comparing where I am in life to where I thought I'd be by now. All I can say for certain is that in this particular scenario, I'd very much rather be in my position than the soon-to-be fathers. I imagine that by now, the baby will probably be born. I've had the good fortune and good company of those around me to not have heard either way. I know this is the preferable position to be in, not knowing than the alternative, but I can't help but wonder every now and then. The good news is that, when I really think about it, there are more and more days now that I don't think about her and her dumpster fire of a life at all, and I consider that progress. There are still bad days, made even worse by the stay-at-home orders, making for incredibly depressing days. I have the good fortune to work from home as an independent contractor right now, which allows me to work from my computer. But those are very lonely days. I try to go for walks, but I do miss the gym. I've spent as much time as I can visiting my parents, just to have some companionship without having to talk to someone over the phone or on a webinar. I know the situation we find ourselves in is shared, and affects everyone's lives. I'm not going through this alone. When I start to feel hopeless, I remember how, in the early days after my D-Day, I felt like I would never make it through. But I did, and I will make it through this trying time, one day at a time, moment by moment, 
if necessary. Time does not seem to move quickly. I want to thank everyone who has read my update and caught up on everything. I also want to thank everyone who has commented, messaged, and supported me during this whole life event. I can honestly say that this community's strength has saved me, encouraged me, and given me another chance at living a happy life after escaping the horrible experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's to another two years of surviving and thriving. Last news. Once more, hello everyone. A year has passed since my last post, and in that time, a good number of people have contacted me on Reddit with questions and support regarding the experience I had three years ago. A spike in messages occurred when my posts were picked up by the strong, successful male YouTube channel and R space, hello, and became videos that drew hundreds of comments from people all over the internet, including armchair quarterbacks who felt they knew better than me, that I shouldn't have handled the situation, that they didn't believe me, etc. The Reddit community is still incredibly understanding and supportive of what I've gone through, and it's helped me have some really great conversations with people who have gone through similar experiences in their lives. The remaining messages came from people who are already familiar with my story and wanted to know how I'm doing these days. So I thought I'd post again to express my gratitude to all of you for helping me get through this. Every single comment and message has helped me in some way, even on my worst days. Three years have passed since D-Day, and over a year has passed since my last post. This past year has been the first where I've been able to finally focus on myself. I have no update regarding my ex-wife or her situation because I have completely cut off contact with her family on all platforms. I even had to mute or block mutual friends where it was possible that unwelcome information could have gotten through. Honestly, it was very difficult to go no contact with her family because up until she made the decision to do what she did, they were my family. I loved some of them as I would blood relatives, and coming to terms with losing those relationships was difficult and unfair, but ultimately necessary. I knew from my past experiences that keeping anything that had to do with her or her family off my feed was going to give me the best chance to focus on my life, moving forward, not letting my mind get lost in the past. As time goes on, there are a lot more days that I don't think about her at all than when I do. And even when I do think about her today, it's more of a thank God I dodged that crap storm than anything to do with grief or suffering. So I know the Technica is working for me and helping me. I took a big risk last year during the pandemic and launched my own independent consulting business providing tech support and system design. It was well worth it as I was able to secure several contracts pretty quickly including two government organizations in the county where I live. The work has been extremely demanding, but both of these contracts have been renewed for an additional year. With no signs of slowing down, my work life is solid. My finances are far better than they have ever been. My mind is mostly free of the memories that haunted me. My body is in better shape than it has been since the whole thing started, and I'm feeling good about myself as a man. Working for myself and having the freedom to make such a decision with no one dependent on my success except for myself has been invigorating, and I take so much pride in the work I'm able to deliver to my clients. Having that feeling of self-worth has made a huge difference in how I view the past, and not so much feeling worried about the present or the future. The one area I'm a bit concerned with has to do with a general lack of trust in people, but especially women in a romantic sense. My lack of trust in people made leaving my job easy and going into business for myself a no-brainer. I don't have to count on anyone but myself to get the job done, and the job always gets done. But romantically, the urge to be with someone has faded drastically. I'm fine being alone, and in my brief exploration into online dating, I realize that for the most part, it's nothing but a cesspool of broken people. I came to this conclusion after three or four dates that turned out to be extremely underwhelming experiences with women who weren't really looking for something of substance, as their profiles would have had you believe, but rather attention-deprived women 
who wanted the undivided attention of men they were speaking or meeting with. I don't believe a single one of those dates I went on about a year ago were only talking to me at the time, which made me feel like I was condoning their playing the field. I've had enough of that for one lifetime. There's a big part of me that yearns for that connection and intimacy, and I want to share my life with someone. But just because I feel that way doesn't mean that I'm going to let just anyone into my life for the sake of not being alone. I'm willing to be patient, do the work I need to do to continue putting my life on its best course, and keep my eyes, ears, and heart open to the idea that I can love again someday. I don't mean to sound disrespectful to any women, that I've taken a pill or am going my own way. I think about myself a lot more than I would like to, but I have this annoying self-talk that keeps telling me that, at 34, I should be married with children and living a happy life like all my other friends who have mortgages, travel, lavish attention on their kids, and seem to be living their best lives. What do I have? Money in the bank? Does that make you feel better about your life? While I know that I will never be able to live up to the idealized timeline I have in my head, for the time being, I am thankful for the life I have, grateful that I am not living a different version of myself, with my ex-wife still attached to me, and hopeful that if I keep putting myself first and living each day to the fullest, one day I will be able to look back and say that I made the best of being dealt a pretty bad hand to begin with. I sincerely appreciate all of your time, counsel, encouragement, and wise words. Without you, I could not have succeeded. Music, on to the comments. Tell me more lies is how we begin. That's a horrible journey you've been on, but as I say, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. So you must be extremely strong now. Please stick around this and other infidelity subs and websites and support others who show up here by chance. You've gained knowledge that newcomers will desperately need. You know how screwed up you were when you first posted, and how some of the advice helped you. Please try to pass this along to the next person who doesn't need it. We're shut down by Ben there, done that. I'm one of the many people who have read your story along the way. And I must admit that I was intrigued by it, and wondered how everything would turn out. Quite often, people would make a post, and then never provide an update, which is understandable in that it's difficult to keep throwing out the details of traumatic events in one's life. However, I was impressed by your strength, courage, and dignity through it all, and it's good to see that you're still hanging in there today. It's unfortunate that your current dating experiences aren't all that fantastic, but that's the modern period for you. You won't meet someone right away. You'll meet the ideal person when the time is right. Don't rush things. Best of luck with your recovery. I was happy to see after being hailed as the new man of her dreams for the whole world to see. Buddy must still be somewhere sulking and feeling like the biggest fool in the universe right now. Just thought you probably got a chuckle out of that. Take care. Oh, I don't want to risk opening any old wounds. And you don't have to comment back on it.